Went to Philly, New York, Los Angeles. Now he's back. He's robbed a lot of banks, and he's violent. Betsy nodded. I'd love to meet him. Sounds like a swell guy. It probably had something to do with our scarcity of solid leads that she went with me that morning. We rode in her car to a flea bag hotel on New York Avenue. The Doral was a decrepit, paint-peeling flop house. You take me to all the nicest places, Agent Cavalier said as she climbed out of the car. Tony Brophy was living the Vida Loca up on the fourth floor of the Doral. The hotel desk clerk said he'd been staying there for a week, and that he was a very troubled dude, not a nice person, and a serious asshole. I don't think this place is connected with the Doral in Miami, Betsy said as we took the back stairs. What a dump. Wait until you meet Brophy. He fits right in here. We arrived unannounced at his room and unholstered our guns. I wrapped my knuckles on a scarred bare wood door. What? A gruff voice called from inside. Washington PD, open up. I heard movement. Then someone snapped a few locks on the other side. The door slowly opened and Brophy filled the narrow doorway. He was 6'4 and close to 260, a lot of it bulging muscle. His dark hair was shaved with neat razor lines to the scalp. Asshole DC cop, he said, a non filled a cigarette hanging from his lips. And who's this lovely asshole with you? I'm Senior Agent Cavalier, FBI, Betsy said. Senior Agent? Let's see. What's the line from all the cop shows on TV? We can do this the hard way, or we can do this the easy way, he said, and showed off his surprisingly even white teeth. He was wearing black paramilitary pants, off-white shower thongs, no shirt. His arms and upper torso were covered with jailhouse tats and curled black hair. I vote for the hard way, but that's just me, Betsy said. Brophy turned to a skinny blonde who was sitting on a lime green retro couch propped in front of a TV. She wore a loose-fitting FUBU shirt over her underwear. You like her as much as I do, Nora? Brophy asked the blonde. The woman shrugged, apparently uninterested in anything but Rosie O'Donnell on TV. She looked like she was probably high. Brophy looked back at Betsy Cavalier and me. I take it, uh, we have business to discuss? So, the mystery lady is FBI, that's very good. Means you can afford any information I might have. We followed Brophy to a lopsided wooden table in a tiny kitchen. We had to arrive at a financial agreement before he would give up anything. He was right about one thing. Betsy Cavalier's budget was a lot bigger than mine. This has to be good information, though, she warned. He nodded confidently. This is the best you can buy, baby, top of the line. You see, I met with the man behind those nasty jobs in Maryland and Virginia. Brophy stared hard at Betsy and me. He definitely had our interest. He called himself, um, Mastermind. Brophy said in a slow, Florida drawl. He was dead serious about it. Mastermind. You believe it? The two of us met at the Sheridan Airport Hotel. He contacted me through a guy I know from New York, Brophy went on. The so-called Mastermind knew things about me. He ticked off my strengths, then weaknesses. He had me down to a T. Think he was a cop? All the information he had about you? I asked Brophy. Brophy grinned broadly. No, nah, too smart. He might have talked to some cops, though, considering he knew everything. That's why I stayed and listened to the dude. That, plus he told me this was a high six-figure opportunity for me. That caught my interest. What did he look like, I asked. You want to know what he looked like? That's the million-dollar question, Regis Philbin. Let me set the scene for you. When I walked into the room of his hotel, there were bright lights shining at me, like Hollywood premiere movie lights. I couldn't see shit. Not even shapes, I asked Brophy. You must have seen something. His silhouette. He had long hair, or maybe he was wearing a wig. Big nose, big ears. Like a car with the doors open. We talked, and he said he'd be in touch. But I never heard from him again. Guess he didn't want me for his crew. Why not, I asked Brophy. Why wouldn't he want someone like you? Brophy made a pistol with his hand and shot me. He wants killers, dude. I'm not a killer. I'm a lover. Right, Betsy? 
During a robbery, the new crew members called themselves Mr. Blue, Mr. White, Mr. Red, and Ms. Green. That morning at precisely seven, Mr. Blue was in position in the thick fir woods behind a house in the Woodley Park section of Washington. As he'd done for the past three mornings, the bank manager, Martin Castleman, left his home at around twenty past seven. Castleman peered around the neighborhood before he got into his car. It was possible he was spooked by the recent bank robberies in Maryland and Virginia. Castleman's wife was a teacher at Dumbarton Oaks High School. She taught English, which Mr. Blue had always hated. Mrs. C. would be leaving for work sometime closer to eight. Blue crouched beside an old elm. He waited for a call on his cell phone. Everything was on schedule so far. Approximately eight minutes after Martin Castleman left, the phone rang. He pushed the talk button. Blue, talk to me. Mr. C. has arrived for our meeting. He's in the parking lot as we speak. Over. Roger that. Everything looks good for my meeting with Mrs. C. No sooner had Blue pushed end on the phone when he saw Victoria Castleman step out of the front door of the house and lock up. She had on a pink suit and reminded him of Farrah Fawcett in her glory days. Where the hell is she going? he said, surprised. There weren't supposed to be any surprises on this job. The mastermind had supposedly scoped everything out perfectly. This wasn't perfection. Mr. Blue started to walk fast through the tangle of woods and high weeds separating him from the Castleman house. He could already see that he wasn't going to make it in time. He began to run toward Hawthorne Street, but she was already inside her black Toyota Tercel and backing out of the driveway. If she turned right, everything was completely screwed. If she turned left, he still had a chance to save the day. Come on, Farrah, honey, go left. Good girl. She had turned left, but he still didn't think he could get to the freaking road in time to stop her. He started to sprint. He couldn't remember the last time he'd had to run at full tilt like this. Hey! Hey! Can you help me? He called at the top of his voice. Please help me! Help! Victoria Castleman's head of teased blonde hair turned when she heard the shouts coming on her street. She slowed the car a little, but she still didn't stop completely. He had to stop her. My wife's having a baby, Blue shouted. Please help, my wife's having a baby. He sighed with incredible relief when he saw the black sedan stop in the middle of the road. He hoped that no busybody neighbor was watching from one of the houses lined up and down the street. He was still gasping as he ran up to the car. What's the matter with you? Where's your wife? Victoria Castleman called to him through the open window. Mr. Blue continued to wheeze until he was right up beside the car. Then he pulled out a Sig Sauer pistol and whacked her jaw with the barrel. Victoria Castleman's head snapped to the side and she cried out in pain. We're going back to the house, he shouted as he jumped into the car. He held the gun to her forehead. Where the hell were you going at 740? Oh, just shut up. I don't really care. You made a mistake, Victoria. You made a bad mistake. A robbery was in progress at the Chase Manhattan Bank branch near the Omni Shoreham Hotel in Washington. Betsy Cavalier and I didn't talk much on the ride from the FBI offices to the bank. We were both dreading what we might find. Betsy was all business. She placed a siren on the side roof, and we raced through Washington. Police sirens were wailing up ahead. I saw the blue and white sign for the Chase Bank branch. Betsy stopped about a block away on 28th Street. It was as close as we could get. There were a hundred spectators, dozens of ambulances, police cruisers. Even a fire truck had arrived on the scene. We ran toward a modest red brick building on the corner of Calvert. Metro Police, Detective Cross, I said, and flashed my badge at a patrolman who tried to block the way into the bank parking lot. The patrolman saw the gold shield and stepped aside. The assorted police and emergency sirens continued to wail loudly, and I wondered why. The moment I walked inside the bank lobby, I knew. I counted five bodies, tellers and executives, three women, two men. All had been shot dead. An FBI agent hurried up to us. 
His name was James Walsh, and I remembered him from the first meeting at the field office. Five are dead here. They're all on staff, bank employees. Hostages at home, Betsy asked. Walsh shook his head. The manager's wife is dead, too. Shot at close range. Executed for no reason we can figure out. Betsy, they left a survivor at the bank. He has a message for you and Detective Cross. It's from someone called the Mastermind. The survivor's name was Arthur Strickland, and he was being kept in the slain manager's office, as far away as possible from the press. He was the bank's security guard. Strickland was a tall, slender, well-built man in his late forties. Although physically impressive, he looked to be in a state of shock. Beads of perspiration covered his face, his thick mustache. His light blue uniform shirt was entirely soaked through. Betsy went up to the bank guard and spoke very softly, compassionately. I'm Senior Agent Cavalier from the FBI. I am in charge of this investigation, Mr. Strickland. This is Detective Cross from the D.C. Police. I hear you have a message for us. They were nice people that got killed here today. They were my friends, he said. I, I was supposed to protect them. It's a terrible thing that happened, but it's not your fault, Betsy said to the guard. Why did the gunman kill them? How did you get away? The guard shook his head in dismay. I didn't get away, he said. They held me in the lobby with the others. Two of them did the job. All of us were told to stay face down on the floor. They said they had to be out of the bank quarter past eight. No later than that. No mistakes, they said, several times. No alarms, no panic buttons. They were late getting out of the bank, I asked Arthur Strickland. No, sir, the guard said to me. That's just it. They could have made it on time. They didn't seem to want to. They told me to stand up. I thought they were going to shoot me right then. They gave you a message for us, I asked him. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. A message for both of you. You like this bank? One of them asked me. I said, I, I, I like my job. He called me a dumb spade asshole. Then he said that I was to be their messenger. I should tell FBI agent Cavalier and Detective Cross that there was a mistake made at the bank. He said... There could be no more mistakes. He repeated that several times. No more mistakes. He said, tell them the message is from the mastermind. Then they shot everybody else. They shot them where they lay on the floor. There can be no more mistakes. The mastermind knew all about the FBI's Betsy Cavalier and Detective Cross. He was on top of everything, even the police officers assigned to the case. They were part of his plan now. It was a gorgeous day for his excursion into the countryside outside Washington. The current bank robbing crew was staying in a farmhouse just south of Hayfield, Virginia. It was a little more than 80 miles southwest of Washington, almost in West Virginia. He rounded a bend on an unpaved road and saw the rear end of Mr. Blue's van jutting out of a faded red barn. A pair of dogs were roaming in the yard, biting at horseflies. He didn't see any of the gang yet, or their girlfriends, but he did hear their loud rock and roll music. He walked into the farmhouse living room, which had been remodeled to resemble a loft. He saw Mr. Blue, Mr. Red, Mr. White, and their girlfriends, including Ms. Green. A broom was leaning against one wall, which meant they had cleaned up a little before he arrived. Hello, everybody, he said and waved shyly. He smiled, but knew that they considered him a geek. So be it. Hey, Moan Professor, Blue said and gave him a lighthearted grin that was so insincere it hurt. The mastermind wasn't fooled. Mr. Blue was a stone-cold killer. That was why he had been chosen. They were all killers, even the three girls. Pizza! He held up two boxes and a paper bag. I brought pizza and some excellent Chianti. Killjoy, he was thinking to himself. Killing machine. Killing time. Killer idea. Killing fields. The mastermind smiled thinly at his own obsessive wordplay. It was the kind of half-smile that didn't feel good on his face, though. It felt false and a little forced. It was just past four o'clock, and it was still brightly sunny outside. He'd gone for a nice walk in the fields. 
He'd thought everything through. Now he was returning to the farmhouse. He entered 